Thank you. Thank you very much. And what Dr. Falwell told you about putting his picture in the corn crib to keep the rats out, that'll work. Because a man told me he put one in and the rats brought back corn they stole two years ago. <laughs> I'm always happy to come and to be here. This is the greatest place on earth to me. God's blessing. I appreciate, I appreciate Dr. Falwell. He's really, he's really organized his forces. He's drawn the battle lines, and he's bombarding them now with shot and shell throughout this nation and other parts of the world. And I mean, he's one who doesn't use any BB gun. He doesn't use a BB gun or a pea shooter. Man, he's loaded his old double-barrel gospel gun with ham arms and log chains and salt rock and cayenne pepper and TNT and turpentine, and he's damped the powder down till the ramrod jumps out about six inches and cock both barrels and let her go in the fur fly and their furnishments all over this country. <laughs> Amen. He's a positive and also a negative preacher, eh? Fellow said, well, I'm a, I'm a positive preacher. I said, I am too, and a negative also. Because you undertake to get your battery charged with a positive without a negative, you'll never get any sparks. Amen. That's Amen. what I mean. Amen. So we got to have a little preaching against. And so that's what he's doing. And so I thank God for it. I thank God for it. He's something really special to us. I said to him the other day, I said, Dr. Farwell, you're just 10 years younger than our boy. Our boy was 31 when he went away to be with the Lord. He would now have been 55 had he lived. But I said, Mommy Bob, and he called her Mommy Bob. I said, Mommy Bob and I have sort of adopted you as our boy. And so we pray for you and work with you. And I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Now I'm going to bring a message to you today in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians in verse 11. Second chapter of Ephesians, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, but that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, these words were spoken of the Ephesian Christians before they were saved. I want to call your attention this, uh, today to just two little words that come to us out of the dark background of this picture. And those two words are these, no hope. There are no words in the English language that have a more dreadful meaning than those two words. Doctor stands beside the bed upon which is a sick man, finger upon the sick man's pulse, anxious that the family awaits the verdict. And presently, he says, prepare for the worst. There is no hope. Now, those are sad words in connection that we just used them, but they're darker still in the connection that we find them in this text. Far better had a man be without anything else in this world than to be without hope for a future life. You may be in great present prosperity, but if you have no hope. Or you may be in great present distress, but if you have no hope. That amounts to but little. I want to talk to you now about three people that I, that's mentioned in the Word of God that stands absolutely without any hope. Before I tell you who they are, it might be well for us to explain what we mean by the word hope. We use the word hope in a very careless way. God always uses it with the greatest of care. Desire, no matter how strong that desire may be, is not hope. Mere expectation is not hope. Hope, according to the Bible, is the well-founded, well-grounded expectation for the future. Now, who is it that has no well-grounded, well-founded expectation for the future? First, the man who doubts or denies the existence of God stands without any hope. The man who denies the Bible as the Word of God stands without any hope. The man who rejects Christ as the Son of God stands without any hope. So may I come to the first one. The man who doubts or denies the Word of God stands without any hope. Because man's only rational hope for a future life rests upon the existence of a, of a beneficent, omnipotent God ruling in nature and the affairs of men. Take that God out of the universe and man stands absolutely hopeless. Absolutely hopeless. You say, Dr. Lakin, do you believe that there's any that does not believe, that do not believe in the existence of God? 
Well, not many, but I've met a few little in for hells around over the country, but I never paid them much mind because most of them was so narrow between the eyes. A fleek as set a straddle of the bridge of their nose and kick them in both eyes at the same time and never inconvenience himself in the least. But I met Charles Evan Smith one day, 50 years ago, the president of the League of Atheism from New York City. I said to him, Mr. Smith, do you believe in theistic evolution? He said, no, I do not believe in a God at all. I said, well, how do you account for everything that is? He said, everything that is just happened to be. Like I'd take the letters of the alphabet and cut them to pieces, throw them up in the air, and they would just happen to become the 23rd Psalm. Or I would take this watch with all of its intricate mechanism and say, back of this intelligent creation, there was no creator. Back of this design, there was no designer. He said, the fact is, sir, I do not believe that I exist, either in mind or soul. I said, I'll admit the mind part of it. I don't know about your soul. <laughs> I'll admit myself, I think you're a non-entity when it comes to brains. And then I asked him this question, and I want you young people to listen to this. I said, Mr. Smith, do you believe that a theistic evolutionist could be a Christian? He said, absolutely not. It's absolutely impossible. He said the fact of the matter is any man who is an evolutionist that stops short of atheism is simply a dishonest thinker. He's simply a dishonest thinker. I said, why would he, why could it not be a Christian? He said, he, he said evolution says that man did not fall, that he climbed down out of the trees and started to walk. He said, if man did not fall, man does not need a savior. Did the monkeys sin? Therefore, when you destroy the Garden of Eden, you have chopped down the need for the cross of Christ. Right. You have chopped down the need for the cross of Christ. And so I want to talk to you now for a little while on some reasons why I know there is a God. Not why I think. You see, I'm not an educated man. Therefore, I can say why I know. <laughs> an educated man is not supposed to know anything. <laughs> He's supposed to say perhaps or it could have been. Somebody asked me if I could read Greek. I said, man, I can hardly read English, <laughs> let alone Greek. A fellow was trying to teach me some Greek about baptism. He said, it's baptizo and rantizo. I said, yeah, and grave e, grave i, and grave o, but it would just sop when I was a kid. You couldn't. <laughs> I'm like the word girl was down in Georgia when they said, can you read writing? And she said, Law, honey, I can't even read reading. Let me tell you this. But I'm, I'm going to say this. You're not supposed to be dogmatic, you know, but I'm going to dogmatically say that I know there is a God. Amen. And I'm as positive of it as I'm standing behind this platform today, that there is a God. And I'm going to give you some reasons why I know there is a God. First of all, I know it from the argument of creation. Look at, at what all, the, all that you see now, from whence did it come? Life has never been generated from dead matter. From nothing, nothing can come. Suppose I take a bottle and pour out all the air and the water and the germs. I'd cork it up till nothing is in it. I'd cork it up till nothing could get in it. From nothing, nothing could come. How would anything ever be in it? That's what we call a complete vacuum. Nothing in it and nothing can get in it. You see, I don't believe in a complete vacuum. Honey, if you'd followed me over the world for 60 years and looked into the faces of a lot of things I've had to preach to, you would believe in it in this time, amen? <laughs> nothing in it, nothing can get in it. But let me tell you this. It's like a lady said, I didn't get nothing to take home with me when I came to hear you preach. I said, honey, you didn't bring anything to get it in. That's the trouble. I can furnish the point, but I can't furnish the intelligence to see it with, amen? Therefore, I know from the argument of creation Life has never been generated from dead matter. From whence did it all come? I believe in the beginning God created. I believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now someone said the Bible says in the beginning God. The Bible didn't say that. The Bible says in the beginning God created. Why? Because did God didn't have any beginning. He was the beginning of beginnings. There was a time when God was alone in the world. There was no trees, no grass, no water, no foliage, no nothing, just God. Just God. In the beginning, God. And I believe that all that went on back there, only God knows about. Only God knows about because he was there and had it put down in this book. Now, a lot of these atheists and so forth, do, they weren't there. They're like a little boy going to school, and he caught him a bumblebee and put it in a bottle and put it in his hip pocket. And he got to school and wriggling around in the, in the seat, the, the cork came out of the bottle and business picked up in town. 
and he did that and he did that. And the teacher said, Johnny, sit down there. What are you doing? He said, there's something going on back there that you don't know about. Amen. <laughs> so the thing I'm saying, something went on back there that only God knows about. And therefore only God could tell us. Amen. So that's the reason I know that there was a time when God was alone. And God alone knows what went on. Now, let me say the second thing. I believe that there is a God because of imparted wisdom because of imparted wisdom. You don't call it imparted wisdom, you call it inherited instinct. There is no such a thing as instinct. There's no such a thing as instinct. Long in the fall of the year, before the wind roars down over the Rockies, up around the lakes and the gulfs, the geese and the ducks all get together, and they form in companies, and old General Gander takes the lead, and they lift up and they fly like that, because getting behind a truck will pull you along, but anyway, uh, and they fly down across Michigan and Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee and North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia and Florida and drop into the wa warm waters of the Gulf to bathe their breasts in the warm waters of spring and then they turn and come back again. Who told that goose to go north, go south in the winter and come north in the summer? Who told her to do that? You say, that's instinct. Where'd they get their instinct, old goosey? That's the next thing. Let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. Those geese that made that trip had never made that trip before. They'd never made that trip before, and yet they make that from up yonder in Canada all the way to Florida, and they never miss a feeding ground. They never miss a feeding ground, and they drop in the waters at the exact precision, at the exact place. Now, where did they get their navigating ability? Where'd they get their navigating ability? They never miss their, they never miss the target any more than a fellow coming back from, uh, than an astronaut coming back from outer space. Where'd they get their, oh, you say instinct. Well, let me say this, out in California, they have a spider about the size of a shoe button. That little spider builds its nest inside an empty clamshell or oyster shell. And before he does that, he lifts that clamshell or oyster shell from six to 12 inches from the ground. For that little spider to do that, to lift that oyster shell, which is many, many times the weight of that little spider, requires an engineering feat equal to the building of the pyramids of Egypt. How does he do it? He goes up and puts on a thread, comes down, hooks it on the shell, goes up and hooks on another, comes down and hooks it on the other side. That thread is moist. When it dries, it contracts. And he keeps putting them on. They keep drying and contracting until he lifts it. Where'd he learn how to do that? You say he learned, that's instinct. He learned it from his mommy and poppy spider. Where'd they learn it? They learned it from theirs. Where'd they learn it? They learned it from theirs. Listen, old smarty, the first spider that ever did that thing then had to sit down and figure it out for himself, didn't he? <laughs> it's not inherited instinct. It's imparted wisdom. Amen. It's imparted wisdom. That's the reason I know that there is a God. Let me tell you another thing, my friend. I'm going to tell you another thing. I know there is a God because of fulfilled prophecy. Prophecy is the writing of history before it happens. Every religion has its Bible, but this is the only Bible of all the religions that has a word of prophecy in it. Why? Because the author of those, of those books knew that the moment that they put a word of prophecy in their book and it failed to be fulfilled, their book would be discredited. But this book with daring boldness tells you what will happen upon this earth to men, to nations, and to individuals a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand years in the future. Who could write a book like that? Who could write a book like that? Only God could write a book like that, my friend. That's the reason I know. I can take the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ alone and prove to any thinking man that there must be a God. The prophecies concerning Jesus Christ alone. First of all, he said he shall be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Not just in Bethlehem, not just in Judea, but Bethlehem of Judea. There might have been other Bethlehems, but he pinpointed this one. Amen. He shall be born in Bethlehem of Judea, and thank God he was. And he said he shall be born of a virgin, and thank God he was. Amen. Amen. Not of a young woman, as the new Bible says, but he was born of a virgin. Uh, he was born of a virgin. A little girl came home from college one day and said to me, Dr. Lincoln, the professor said that Jesus couldn't have been born of a human mother without a human father. That was a biological impossibility. I said, well, ring a ding ling. I said, let me tell you what you do. You tell the little possum-headed professor that your uncle said that the first man that ever got in this world got here without either father or mother. Now crack that in, old smarty. <laughs> And if the first man got here without either father or mother, if God wanted to send his son born of a human mother without a human father, he could and did do it. She said, but the first, the first germ came from another planet. I said, where'd the germ come from? 
Life has never been generated from dead matter. And he came, the first germ came on a meteor. I said, honey, don't you know a meteor is a blazing ball of fire? How would a germ live in that? I said, you better get in the house. Automobile will run over you and kill you. Let me show you something. <laughs> But she said evolution, the theory of evolution is the same thing. That's the most, uh, that's the most insane thing I've ever heard, amen? And to be, be an evolutionist, all you'd have to do is to switch your brain out of reason and throw it into neutral. That's all you'd have to do. Yeah. To believe that, the story of evolution, she said the, the evolution theory, that's the most up-to-date theory that are way back yonder sometime, somewhere, somehow, nobody knows when, how, where, or why, nothing formed to something, and a germ got in the water somehow, and the water developed it into a tadpole, and one day the tadpole swam to another bank and got stuck in the mud and dried there, and wriggling around in the mud, he formed warts on his belly, and later they became legs. After developed legs, he was climbing through the trees one day, his foot slipped, and as he fell, he wrapped his tail around the limb, the jaw of it broke off his tail, he hit the ground, stood up on his hind feet, walked across the street, bought him a suit of clothes, went to teaching in the university and said, thank God I'm a man at last. <laughs> oh, beloved, listen to me, listen. They can cram that down the neck of some kids, but let them try the old man once. Let me show you something. I'll stack my cards with any son of an ape I've ever met. Amen. <laughs> A friend of mine said that he talked to a man trying to lead him to Christ, and he said, I'm an evolutionist. I believe we came from monkeys. And the fellow got, fella got in the hospital and sent for my friend to come to see him, and he went to see him, and he said, they say I'll have to ma have a major operation, and I've got to have some blood. I wonder if some of the people at the church would send me some blood. And old Percy said, why don't you go to the zoo and get some of the original stock? <laughs> Amen. Ah, oh, the little boy said, Mama, how did God make himself? He was reasoning from that old atheistic philosophy that everything that is had to have a beginning. Everything that is did have to have a beginning except God, and he is the beginning of beginnings. Amen. Let me tell you something, my friend. That's the reason I know that there is a God. He said he shall be born of a virgin. He was. He said they would gamble upon his garments. They did. He said they would pluck out his beard. They did. He said he would make his death with the wicked. He died between two thieves. And with the rich in his burial he was. He was buried in, a, in Joseph's new tomb. And on the third day he said, you'll put me to death, but I'll rise again. You'll try, you can't kill me, but I'll give up my life anyway. And I'll rise again on the third day. And I go down and stand beside that tomb on the early morning. And I look in and the, and the skin begins to loosen on his forehead and a halo plays round his head and his eyes begins to open and the breath of God sleep through that slumbering clay and up from the grave he arose a mighty triumph tore his foes and lives forever with his saints to reign hallelujah Christ arose and he walked out on the other side and dangled the key to his girdle and said I am he that was dead and am alive and behold I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of hell and because I live you too shall live also a friend of mine said you can't go to heaven with that going in our church St. Peter's got the keys I said let him keep them I've got the door <laughs> Amen. Oh, Bill, listen, kids, don't let anybody fool you. This is the book that will stand the test. Let me give you another one. The fool has said in his heart there is no God, and only a fool would say that. I was driving along one day with a fellow going to Detroit. We'd have been snowbound and had to leave the plane and get us a, a car. And he said, I said, I'm a Baptist preacher. He said, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in a God. I said, I saw your name in the Bible. I had a little testament there, and he said, you didn't see my name? I said, oh, yes, I did. He said, where are I right here? For the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I said, Mr. Fool, I'm glad to know you. <laughs> I didn't think I'd ever see you. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's like a little boy shining a fellow's shoes down in Georgia, and he's kept saying, there is no God. And the little boy looked up and said, Mr. the Bible say that the fool has said in his heart there's no God, but you done blabbed it right out of your big mouth, haven't you? <laughs> Here's what I'm telling you. That's the reason I know. You know, I'm asking God to let me live a few more years Amen. because I believe I got a message for these people. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The life that now is, you say, Brother Lakin, let me give you one more quickly. The, the, the man who denies the Bible is the Word of God. You say, Brother Lakin, you believe a man denies the Bible is the Word of God, stands without any hope? Yes. Why? Because of man's rational 
All of man's reasoning and rational thinking will never give him a foundation on which he can stand and give a reason for the hope that's in him concerning Christ. And the only foundation you'll have in this, is in this mighty giant oak that stood on the mountains of eternity and entwined its roots throughout the rock of ages and listened to the winds of criticism vainly lashed themselves to fury at, at, in his branches. That's the anvil that's worn out of many a critical, a critical sledge. And my dad and mother put their head on that, pillowed their head upon that and passed peacefully into another world. I know that's the word of God. A little two by squirt came up to me not long ago. He had an Australian sheepdog haircut and a pair of pants and there at the bottom he'd have to grease his feet to get them on. <laughs> and he said to me, and he was feeling his upper lip for the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And he said, you don't believe in evolution, do you? I said, I didn't. But now I'm not so sure. <laughs> he hadn't been off the limbs too long. <laughs> a man who denies it stands without any hope in this world and in the world to come. And in the world to come. He has no hope of meeting with his loved ones who have gone or who may go. My brother-in-law was buried yesterday, the last one I had. The last one I had, my sister and I, the only two of six children that's living, buried out yonder in Missouri. My boy yonder on a little hillside in West Virginia, there waiting in a grave that Jesus cleaned out and made a good place for him to wait for the resurrection. One day I believe in God and that they'll come forth from the grave. Amen. And I'll see them again. Amen. Amen. Don't take that hope away from me, Mr. Modernist, Mr. Evolutionist, because it hangs a rainbow of hope around the shimmering shoulders of the dying storm of my bereavement. That's the hope. And without him, there's no hope of pardon in the eternal world. It's offered you now, but after a while, it's too late. I trust this is it.